lecture. Um, hello, everyone. Um, welcome to the Math Methods 3 4 um, lectures. Um, so, this is presented by Aton Notes, that you guys already know. Um, some other sort of resources Aton Notes offers, apart from these lectures, uh, study notes, um, you know, newsletters, articles, etc., to you know really help you guys get that you know boost on your studies. So definitely check those stuff out. Um, we also have other resources um, like you know study guides um, and tutoring as well. All right. So without further ado, um, let's get started. So um, my name is AJ. Um, I graduated in 2021, so like two-ish years ago, which feels like a while, um, and. Yeah, I currently study um, neuroscience and genetics at the Australian National University. Um, I don't think I wrote my email on here, so I'll quickly do that. Um, so my email is aj at cutesmart.com. So if anyone has any questions about, you know, um, like the things I study as well, and alongside obviously like the methods questions, um, feel free to shoot me an email. Um, but yeah, I'm more, more than happy to give advice on, you know, moving interstate because I grew up in Melbourne and then moved to Canberra for university. So, you know, if anyone is thinking of moving interstate, um, feel free to shoot me an email to talk about that. And also, obviously, feel free to shoot me an email about any methods questions um, and, you know, your, like, making bound references, studies, all of that in general. Um, also, feel free to drop questions in chat while you're watching. Um, I'll be lurking in chat and answering any questions that pop up. Um, before we, you know, get started into the content stuff, I would like to suggest that if you see a question that's already been asked, um, try not to ask it again, just because if duplicates come in, I'll only be answering one of them. Um, there might be an upvote function. Um, if there is an upvote function and you see a question you like, just press upvote, it'll probably go to the top of the list and I'll see that. Um, but yeah, so... Hopefully you guys find today useful. Um, you should be able to access the slides. I've changed the order a little bit, um, but it's all about this. It's more or less the same. Um, in some, you know, in the chance that we don't get through the the final remaining stuff, most of these notes are quite detailed. So have a read through them as well. Um, and a lot of this can be put in your bound reference. And I'll talk about the bound reference a little bit at the end as well. Okay. Um, an overview of what we're covering today. Uh, we're going to be doing first, we're going to talk about integration and antiderivatives. Um, sort of my favorite part of Unit 4, sort of finishes off calculus. Then we're going to start talking about probability. So I'll do a little bit of an introduction to probability. So I'll talk about some of the prerequisite knowledge you guys sort of need for the upcoming stuff. You guys would be familiar with a lot of the, the, the prerequisite stuff. Um, definitely would have covered it in Year 10 and Year 11. And then after that, we're going to be talking about um, discrete probability and then an extension of discrete probability known as binomial distributions. Then we're going to sort of finish up with continuous and normal probability or normal distributions. All right, let's get started with integration. So integration or taking an antiderivative is the opposite to doing a derivative. So if I have some derivative function here, right, so you can see that it's like d f of x with respect to dx, right? That's taking the derivative of the function f of x with respect to dx. If I want to reverse that and find the original function f of x, I can do this operation known as an integral, right? And a lot of you would have already been, you know, would have encountered this maybe in unit one and two, and probably as, you know, as like from school as well, hopefully. If not, that's all good. Um, it's always good to get a head start on your school. So the integral will always spit out the, the original function that was like derived, I guess, initially. So it'll spit out f of x. And another thing you always need to write with an integral is this plus c. So a lot of you know that when you take a derivative, right? So if I take the derivative of a constant value, maybe something like 4, right? 4 is constant. It doesn't change with any variable. That's going to be equal to 0, right? And so if I have a function like x squared plus 2, if I take the derivative of this function, right, I'll get 2x. That plus 2 is just gone. So if I'm integrating 2x with respect to dx, Sure, I'll get the x squared part, right? But I won't get the 2, because in my mind, the 2 just doesn't exist, right, when I'm doing the integral. So to sort of cover for that, we write a plus c. And now plus c is any real number, more or less, right? And sometimes they'll give you enough information to solve for what c is, right? So maybe they, they'll tell you that it goes through the point 0, 0, 2. And using that, you can work out what plus c is. 
right? But yeah, make sure you include that. Um, usually you lose marks if you don't. Um, there is one case where you won't, and sometimes it'll ask for like, um, well, that's too many ends. They'll ask for like an antiderivative or an, an integral of something. And that just is one solution, right? So um, adding the plus C gives you, like shows you that it's a family of functions, there's multiple solutions. If you don't include the plus C, you're only saying that's the one solution there is to that integral, right? Um, another thing to not forget is the dx. So what that says is that when you take this integral, you're doing it with respect to x, right? The, the change that you're trying to reverse is that change that's been done to x, right? Maybe you'll be sometimes, if you guys are doing um, like sort of those physics application questions, you'll be dealing with functions that are with respect to time. So when you integrate that, you need to change that to dt. Right, so make sure that d whatever at the end is consistent with the actual variable you're integrating. Right, otherwise you will lose marks. Um, in some questions, you'll see that the antiderivative is replaced, uh, represented by a capital F of x, um, and that you know just generally like refers to the original function or the function that's you know being anti-derived. Usually, the question will just tell you because they don't want to confuse you with with random stuff like that. Cool. Let's go through some integration rules. And then maybe we'll have a crack at doing a um, practice question. Okay, so some rules with integration is that if I'm taking an integral and I'm multiplying it by some constant, which is represented by k in this case, that constant can just be dragged out to the front. So what do I mean by that? If I've got the integral of 5 of f of x, f of x doesn't, doesn't really matter what it is. It could be x squared, right? That's the same as taking the integral of 5 times the integral of f of x with respect to dx, with respect to x. Sorry. So it's a relatively straightforward rule, but it can save you a little bit of a headache when you're trying to integrate something or you're trying to change an integral to make it fit a rule. Um, so that is quite useful to know. So yeah, make sure this is a rule that you guys are really familiar with. Um, it should be in your um, like formula sheet that they give you, but I think this is a relatively simple rule to remember. So I hope you guys all remember this one here. Um, another one that, that I think is a little bit more tricky to understand, but is probably more important than the last, in the sense that it's quite particular to some question types, but it is sort of those high yield topics, where often they'll ask you like a lot of questions from that same bit. So splitting up terminals. So um, we'll talk a little bit more about definite integrals in a little bit, but basically the fundamental theorem of calculus, right, is that if we have a definite integral, right, like so, what that means is that we find the original function represented by capital F, and then we subtract, we sub in the values of the terminal, and then we subtract them like so, right? What splitting up the terminal says is that, let's say I have some function, right, that looks a bit like this, right? If I wanna take the integral from A to B, right, and I, you know, have some third point I know as well, maybe some point C, right? I can take the integral from a to c, which is represented by this, and then add that to the integral of c to b, which was represented by this. And you can see from the shaded area that I've shaded in, that still represents the like the total like span of that integral, the total area represented there. We'll talk a little bit more about area under the curve as well when we talk a little bit more about definite integrals. Um, so if you're a little bit lost on this part, don't worry too much. Um, just know that you can split up definite integral um, terminals like so. So I'll sort of um, touch on this again when we do a definite integral question. Okay, um, another thing we can do is that if we have um, two functions that are being added, um, it's really important that they're being added. If they're being multiplied, you can't do this. If they're being added, you can sort of split them up into two different um, integrals like so. So sometimes it can make, you know, if you see a function like this and you, you get like pretty confused and you don't know how to integrate it all in one go, that's all good, or maybe you're just double checking your answer. It's perfectly fine to just split it up into two integrals like this, right? What's not fine is having an integral like this, right? And splitting that up into something like um, this, right? Like this doesn't work. So my integrals are a little bit wonky today, but hopefully you guys, yeah, this wasn't a horrible integral, but whatever. Oh. Um, I just realized the camera cuts that off. That's my bad. Um, I'll rewrite it again. So what you can't do is this, right? So if you have um, 
the integral of x cubed dx, you can't split that up into this. Um, and so just keep that in mind when you're sort of doing this rule. I see a lot of students get confused with this. Also, when you do split it up, um, one thing to note is that these terminals remain the same, right? You're still integrating over you know, that, that terminal, but you can also do it with indefinite integrals. What I mean by indefinite integrals are integrals without those terminals or end and starting and end points. Okay, another cool rule is that we can reverse a terminal, right? So if I'm taking an integral from A to B, um, so the, the starting value is A and then we're ending up at B, that's the same as taking an integral from B to A, with the negative out the front. How can I show this? It's all to do with the fundamental theorem of calculus again. So A to B of F of X, right? Like I said earlier, is equal to capital F of B minus capital F of A, right? Now, if I do the same for B to A of F of X, like so, that's just equal to f of a minus f of b. Now, I'm sure a lot of you can already see this, but if I try and factorize this expression just by taking the negative out, I'll get negative f of b minus f of a, like so, with a negative out the front. Um, and you can see that these two are just, oh, sorry, you can see that these two things here are just negatives of each other, right? So this rule sort of stands. Uh, hopefully that makes sense, is super useful for solving these multiple choice questions that I'll show you in a little bit. Um, some basic rules with an integral. Um, these are just to follow. Um, well, these, these are rules that you have to follow. Um, they are in your formula sheet as well, but I would recommend memorizing them um, just because you don't want to be in exam one flipping through that formula sheet and trying to like fit these rules to these weird integrals that they will give you. So it's better to just know them and understand how they work. Um, and the best way to understand how they work is to just do a bunch of practice questions, okay? All right, um, and this is just then in sort of like a different form. So I, I definitely recommend um, putting this in your bound reference and also this one in your bound reference. But more than that, I would recommend just understanding it entirely, right? Okay, so I sort of mentioned this, um, we can take an integral or an antiderivative between two bounds, right? And that just happens to give the area under the curve. Now I won't go into the reason as to why that gives the area under the curve, but if you are interested, um, there are really good like um, explanations online that sort of go into this. The only reason I won't go into it is that it's out of the scope of methods and it's not really something you need to know, but if it is out of interest, um, a quick Google search generally gives you a good answer for that. Okay, so I've sort of already uh, mentioned the fundamental theorem of calculus, um, just shown here, and I've written out much, or plenty of times earlier. Um, so hopefully that makes a little bit of sense. So again, capital F of X is just the antiderivative of that lowercase f of X. Now, in this case, you guys would have noticed um, that plus C is gone. The DX still remains because we're just saying what we're actually integrating. And in this case, we're integrating a function with X, right? But we can get rid of the plus C. And the reason that is, is the plus C sort of cancels out. So if you guys go ahead and try to do this, um, you will see that the plus C cancels out. So we'll see that with the first um, F of B, right? We'll get F of B plus C, right? That's the first sort of set. And then the next one, we'll get F of A plus C like this. And you can see here that the plus C's just cancel out. So there's no point including them in the first place. So for that reason, we sort of just don't include plus C at all. All right, let's go through an example question. Um, you know, if you guys, when you guys are watching the recording, um, feel free to pause maybe and type your answer in chat as well um, after you get a solution for it, or feel free to follow along. So yeah, either or is fine. Um, I would definitely recommend having a crack at it first before just looking at my answer or looking at the way I'm doing it. Okay, so the question is, it's to evaluate, evaluate a definite integral. Um, so sine, so from zero to pi on two of sine four x plus four x cubed um, with respect to dx. So what we're gonna be using is that table that I showed you guys a few slides earlier and also the fundamental theorem of calculus to sort of evaluate this expression. So the first step is to integrate, right? So to integrate this, I just use those, um, like the, the integral table that I showed a little bit before. So if we integrate sine four of X, we get negative one on four cosine four X. And 
if we integrate this, we just follow the integrating a polynomial rule. And so we add one to here and then divide by that, right? So we add one to the top. So three plus one is four, divide by four, um, and we get this, right? Relatively simple, hopefully. And then after this, now we apply the fundamental theorem of calculus, right? So what I've done here is I've subbed in pi on two into the, um, the calculator expression from earlier. Then I've subtracted that from subbing in zero. So really all I've done is f of b minus f of m, just following a fundamental theorem of calculus. Right? And then from there, it's a matter of evaluating it. Now, evaluating it can be a little bit challenging, um, especially with these sorts of long questions, right? Personally, when I did these in high school, I made a lot of mistakes in these sorts of questions. So what I would do is I'd actually write it out like this, right? I'd take it step by step. I'd break it down um, into smaller manageable bits. And then from there, I'd start doing the, you know, the, the hard maths, right? Like this four pi on two, before even calculating what it was, many of you can probably just look at it and know what the answer is. I just solve like what four pi on two is, right? So I just, I, I just write it out like this, right? Which is like, a reasonably trivial calculation to do, but you'd be surprised at the sort of mistakes you guys would make under exam, like exam pressure, at least I was. I made a lot of silly mistakes. Um, and so a, a lot of what my exam preparation was and my SAC preparation was, was just trying to cut down on those silly mistakes. Anyways, um, I'll probably talk about that a lot as we go through um, the, the, the session. I'll talk a lot about the methods I use to eliminate my silly mistakes and maybe how you guys can apply that to your working out. So one method I always used was writing out my working out in every single step, right? Just because it helps with it. When you go back and read through your working out, you can sort of see all the calculations you've done. And from there, see if you've made any silly mistakes and sort of make sure that you've done it correctly. Okay. Um, so from there, you're just sort of evaluating all of this. So this is an exact value you guys need to know, and that's going to be one here. Um, and that's also equal to what cosine zero is, and that's also one. And so from there, you can sort of just work this out. So hopefully that makes a bit of sense. And this is what our final answer would be. This also gives the area under the curve for this function from zero to pi on two. And when we evaluate that, we get um, pi to the power four by 16. So hopefully you guys got a similar answer. Okay. Um, so this is where, this is just a multiple choice uh, question from a VCO exam. Um, so you guys can see 2019 exam two. If you guys are interested in like, you know, the, the statistics, like what um, like percentage of um, students answered, answered A, B, C, or D, um, you can check that, or E, you can check that out on the VCAA website. Um, they do like, you know, show, obviously they show the correct answer. They don't show the working out too much, which is kind of annoying. Um, but what they do is they do show you like the distribution of students of, like where they, um, who selected each option, um, which I think is pretty interesting. But yeah, if you guys are interested in that, check that out. Um, anyways, so how can we do this? So let's see what the question is asking us, right? So we're asked to find the integral of, um, f of x and we don't know what f of x is. They haven't told us what f of x is. And a lot of people like, um, would see this freak out and just skip it. Right. But we're going to try to break it down and see how we can go about tackling these sorts of questions. So we've got f of x um, with respect to dx is equal to four from one to four, right? We're taking the integral bounded from one to four, okay? Um, and they've also told us that from two to four, it's equal to negative two. And what they want us is to evaluate this. Okay, so how do we do it? Well, I wanna try change, well, I wanna try use these two integrals that they've given me and try fit that into into this integral and try to work it out okay so what does this first integral tell me it tells me that um, capital f of 4 minus f of 1 is equal to 4 right the second integral tells me f of 4 minus f of 2 is equal to negative 2 right and then if i work out what this integral is here right i get capital of f, f of x plus x squared over 2 integrated from 1 to 2 so now i just sub that in and I will get this expression here. Then it's a matter of simplifying that expression. So I see I get f of two minus f of one plus three on two, right? That's still not enough information for me to eliminate any of the options, which kind of sucks, but I guess we just have to sort of deal with it and work through it. Ideally, as you're working through a multiple choice question, you're able to eliminate options as you go. But with these sorts of questions, it's a little bit, a little bit hard to do that. Okay, so maybe some of you guys can see where this is going. 
but we're going to be using simultaneous equations to work out what f of 2 minus f of 1 is equal to. So I need to manipulate these two equations to make the expression f of 2 minus f of 1, so I can sub that in. So what I do is I subtract the red equation from the blue equation, and conveniently when I do that, I work out that f of 2 minus f of 1 is equal to 6. And so then I substitute this into here, and I get 15 on 2. So my final answer is option E, 15 on 2. So hopefully you guys got a similar answer as well. Any questions with how, like the, the method I use to work this out, just drop them in chat and I'm happy to answer them as we go. Okay, um, another useful property of these definite integrals, right, is that we can use it to find the area bounded between two curves. Um, a lot of you will be used to just finding an area bounded between, you know, like a single curve. So you've got some curve like this, and maybe you're just finding it between the x-axis and the function, right? But what we can also do is if we have two functions like that, we can actually just do, oh, that's a wonky line. Let me get rid of that graph. So if, we, if I have two functions like this, I can use definite integrals to find the area contained between those two functions, right? Which is quite nifty. Um, there can be some practical applications to this, but in methods, you don't really cover that. Um, sometimes they give you application questions where that's useful. Maybe you're trying to find the area of a garden bed or something like similar to that, and that garden bed is defined by multiple functions. Um, that's just an example of the sort of application question you could get here. So the way, like the, the general equation that we always use for this is that that contained area is, well, first you need to solve for the x-intercepts, right? So lower x value refers to the, the lowest x-intercept um, between those two functions. Um, for example, if I have a function like this, right, and I want to find the area contained, well, I need to work out what this x-intercept is and what that x-intercept is as well, right? And then from there, I can sort of work out that area in the middle. Okay, so you want to work out what those lower and x values are, and then you want to determine in that region which function is the upper function and which one is the lower function. So in this case, I'm going to call this line g of x, I'm going to call this line f of x. So we can see that in this region, right, from, you know, let's say a to b, in the region from a to b, g of x is above f of x, right? And so g of x, in this case, would be upper curve, and we'd be subtracting f of x from that. Now, let's say I wanted to take the integral of a function that's like this from maybe here to here. Right? So um, call this b again and a again. Right? So, um, so in, in the first period from that first intersection, right, in, in just this area here, the top function, um, let's say, is g of x. The bottom function is f of x. Right now, when we go here into this period, right? So let's just call that middle point C. Um, from C to B, that top and bottom switches, right? So now we have f of x at the top, and we have g of x at the bottom. And when we do this, what we need to do is we need to split this up into separate integrals. I need to take an integral from A to C, and then from C to B to um, like separate integrals because we're changing the upper and lower. Uh, hopefully, that makes a bit of sense. Okay, um, so here's an example question. Um, have a crack at it and we'll sort of go through the answer. Um, also feel free to work with me along as I, work along with me as I go through it. Okay, so what, what it wants is the area bounded by the lines of y is equal to x squared, y is equal to zero, and x is equal to three. Ooh, that's sort of represented on this diagram here, the, the one that I've sort of scribbled on, sorry about that. But we want this area here, right? So they said y is equal to 0, uh, y is equal to x squared, y is equal to 0, right? And um, x is equal to 3, right? Okay, um, how can I do that? Well, I want to determine what the um, lower and, and upper x values are, right? So, well, the, the, the upper x value, right? So this is just the, the representation of the area, sort of. The upper x value is clearly going to be at 3, right? Because that's where that intersection point is going to happen, because that's where that line is, right? So this is at 3. It, it doesn't really matter what y value it is at, because we're not actually using that for the integral. The starting value at y is equal to 0, right, is at x is equal to 0, right? Which is quite convenient. Okay, now the upper function in this case is x squared, right? But what, what's the lower curve, right? We never defined a lower curve. 
Well, the lower curve in this case, right, is going to be the x-axis, right? And the x-axis is given by the equation x is equal to zero. So that's why I subtract with zero, okay? And so from there, it's just a matter of evaluating this integral um, and, you know, using the fundamental theorem of calculus, summing values in, and then, you know, giving, giving your answer. Now, this unit squared stuff is not entirely necessary. I usually write it. Um, sometimes I'll write it like this, right? And now it's just out of habit. Um, that's not something you need to write. Um, and it's perfectly fine to not write it um, because oftentimes you'll see in Vika's answers that they don't have that um, unit squared stuff. Sorry, um, they don't have that unit squared stuff. So nothing to worry about too much. Um, but yeah, so you, you, you can include, basically my point is you can include it or you don't need to include it, it doesn't matter too much. Okay, integration by recognition. So integration by recognition is a really common question type um, and it's not, it's not a particular topic per se, but it's, it's a really common question type. I've definitely seen it in a bunch of exam ones in particular. Why exam ones? The whole idea with integration by recognition is that you're given an integral that you won't usually be able to solve. Usually they're in the form of like some two functions multiplied by each other, like this, right? And a lot of people will be like, well, can't I just split that up into two integrals? No, you can't. They're not being added, right? They're being multiplied together. Okay, so the, the way we do this is this technique known as integration by, um, like it's by parts or IBP. That's out of the scope of the method study design, but there is also another way to do it. So the way methods wants you to do these questions is, well, first they'll give you a function to integrate, right? Well, differentiate. They'll give you a function to, to diff, and then from there you need to work back and find a different integral. For example, we have this part here, and it's usually part A. So they'll be like, differentiate, um, some some function right and then they'll say hence find the integral of this right so the first step is to just inter uh, differentiate right do it in the order they want right so we're first going to differentiate x um, log base e of x um i think it's just the formatting but this should should have just been you know natural log or log base e okay um hopefully that's not confusing anyone um, okay, so we're going to take the uh, derivative of x um, log e of x. I'm going to give everyone um, a couple seconds maybe to just type in chat quickly what rule they think is being used here. Um, if you guys said product rule, um, you would be correct. So since these are two functions being multiplied by each other and we're taking the derivative of them, we want to use product rule, right? So um, a quick recap of product rule. So if I have dy dx, right? Um, where y is equal to two functions, u times v. Um, the first thing we do is we do u times dv dx plus v times du dx. Cool. So that's all I've done in this part. All right. So once I take the derivative, I get 1 plus um, log base e of x. Okay, cool. And then we want to integrate it, right? So if I integrate um, uh, log base one plus log base e of x, I get x log e of x plus c, right? And so then I can do a little bit of rearranging to work out what the um, the log base e of x is actually after doing this, if that makes sense. So um, so ideally we want to get you know we got one. I'm going to write it as ln. That also just means natural log. So we have our derivative as d d of x, x ln of x, right, is equal to this, okay? And I want to integrate ln of x with respect to dx, okay? So what do I do? I rearrange this equation for ln of x. So ln of x is equal to d dx, x ln of x, minus 1. And then I substitute that into there. And so then this integral is equal to um, dd of x times x ln of x minus 1 dx. Okay. And so when I take the integral of a function that's being like derived, I guess, like that, 
the integral and the derivative just cancel out. So what I'm left with is x ln of x plus c, right, minus the integral of, um, oh, you can't really see that, but basically it's just this line here. Um, so x, you know, x ln of x plus c minus the integral of 1 dx. The integral of 1 dx is just x, okay? So that's just x ln of x. Um, minus x plus c. Um, sorry, my writing covers that, but you know the answer is still the same. Cool. Hopefully that makes sense, um, and hopefully my scribblings aren't getting in the way. Um, the scribblings won't be there on the notes, but the notes will have the full solutions. Okay. Um, another application of an integral is to find the average value of a function. You might have heard the term average value pop up with um, sine and cosine functions. So if I have a um, you know sine slash cosine function that looks a bit like this, right? A lot of you already know that the period is equal to two pi on n. You know the amplitude is a, and the plus c is what we call the center, right? Or it's also known as the average value of the function, right? So the average value of the function. So if they give you like a question that's like you know, maybe the temperature is modeled by a sine graph, and they'll be like, well, what's the average temperature? Well, that's just whatever the, the, the plus C or the, the Y translation is, right? Well, another way we can work out what plus C is, or not plus C, sorry, another way we can work out the average value of a function is maybe, you know, it's like some, you know, function like this, Y x squared plus, plus two, doesn't, it doesn't fit a sine graph, right? So how do, you, how do you work out the average function? Well, we can use an integral for that. So the equation for an average function is this, right? So what it actually does is, well, this integral here finds the area and then it spreads it out using this one over B minus A, right? So remember the area of a rectangle or the, the area, I think area in general, right? Is just height times width, right? And so what we're really doing is we're doing H is equal to A over width area we calculate from the integral, the width is given by b minus a, right? And the, that finds the average height of that function, right? Which is also the average value. Cool. Hopefully that makes sense. All right, let's have a crack at this question. So they want us to find the average value of 1 over x over the interval, interval of 2 to 5. Okay, so first thing I like to do is write out my expression. Um, sometimes in an exam, what I would do is just write out the, the actual equation as well, right? So I'll have a to b. So what I mean by the actual equation is just like the um, the average value equation, right? So I'd write this out, and then I'd substitute my values in, right? So maybe even in the question when I'm reading it, I'd annotate what a and b are, just so that when I actually answer the question, I'm not missing you know key pieces of information, and I'm not just randomly putting things in places where they shouldn't be. Um, so I, I annotate the question and then I substitute my values in, hopefully correctly, and then it's just a matter of integrating, right? From that table, um, that integral table that I showed a while ago, um, the one on x, um, you can't just integrate it like this. Oh, don't know what happened there. You can't integrate it as if you were integrating x to the power of negative one, just simply, and you can't integrate it like a polynomial, right? If you have one over x squared, you can convert that to x to the power of negative two and then integrate that like a polynomial because you add one and divide it by two, or divided by the, the, the resultant. In this case, it would be negative one. But with this, if you add one, this is just x to the power of zero, and you can't divide by zero, right? Which is why we have, well, it's not why we have, um, you know, the, the, the integral being log x, but um, luckily the, the derivative of, of the integral of uh, one on x ends up being the natural log of x, right? So that's just, that's just the natural log of x. Um, let's quickly write this out like this, right? Um, and so that's that's all of, that's all that's that's all that's being used to convert from here to here. And then we just substitute things in um, using the fundamental theorem of calculus. Um, and then it's just a matter of solving. So the way that we simplified this to here was just using simple log laws. Um, if you don't remember this, um, I would suggest revising it. So when we're adding two logs together of the same base um, and the same multiple at the front. We multiply, when we're subtracting two logs, we divide the inside product to simplify. Okay, um, and that's sort of it with integrals and integration. Obviously, I haven't gone into a lot of detail regarding integration, 
Um, I haven't talked about the, you know, the wide application type questions, um, but you will see plenty of those um, when you guys go through practice exams and, you know, textbook questions. Um, we didn't go through them just because this is meant to be, you know, sort of like an introduction to these topics um, and not like, you know, like a deep dive into them. Um, but yeah, definitely check out your, you know, practice exams um, and other, like, you know, there's like eight on notes resources that go through these in a lot of depth um, in terms of like question styles. So we've sort of given you guys all the information you need to tackle these sorts of question types, but it's always a good idea to practice these question types, right? So then when you see them in an exam, you're not sort of like panicking and you're not really sure where to go. Um, it's just a good idea to expose yourself to a variety of questions so you can sort of draw similar connections um, to questions that you see in your actual exam. Okay, um, now to start with probability. Um, one thing I'll sort of preface this with is that a lot of people kind of think probability is going to be their worst topic. Um, just simply because, you know, it, I feel like from like maybe year 10 onward, probability does get pretty hard, right? Um, personally, I sucked with probability. So even in year 11, um, I, I really sucked with probability. So when it came, when year, 11, year, year, when, well, when year 12 came around, um, I sort of thought, you know, maybe, you know, I've, I've really got to like crack in because um, I've, I've, I've got to do well, right? And so what I did was, because I really, really sucked at probability, and that's a bit of an understanding, I decided I'd do every textbook question um, on probability. And so if you if you find yourself in a similar boat, maybe you're hating probability and you're, you know, thinking you're really bad at it, um, it's often just a good idea to just do every single textbook question on it. And I know that sounds insane and a lot of work, um, but in the end it did pay off. Um, I think probability ended up being like my best section on, in, in terms of both SACS and exam. Um, just because probability is one of those sections that's really repetitive. What tricks people, and even me still now, is that is the wording, right? And there's only so many question types they can ask you with probability, and the textbook generally contains them really well. So just doing a bunch of que um, questions from the textbook, a bunch of past exams, um, will set you up really well for probability. Um, whereas with integration and other topics, um, they can ask you like, you know, like, like really weird novel questions. They really can't do that with probability. Um, and they're often just repeats of, of each other with different values. With that rant over, we'll sort of get into it. Okay. Um, so what is probability? Probability is the likelihood that an event will occur. And it's always like, you know, placed on a scale from impossible to, to like certain. So 0% chance to 100% chance. Right. So the probability of, you know, an event X, right, is the number of the times event X happens divided by the total number of events. For example, um, if I flip a coin 10 times and I want to know the probability of, you know, getting tails five times, um, I need to flip it 10 times and measure the probability, right? Or measure, like, take account of how many times tails has popped up. And then I divide that, you know, Theoretically, it would be 5, right? And so I'd do 5 divided by 10, and that'll give me the probability of getting a tails. Um, and generally, we measure probability in decimals or fractions. Sometimes you'll see them in percentages, though. And so it's really important that you, when you see a percentage, to convert it back into decimal, right? So sometimes you'll see, like, you know, like a statement, like 50% chance of X happening, right? Um, but it's, it's a better idea to convert it to decimal because those calculations are easier to deal with. Um, even though I've said that, decimals are kind of bad to deal with. So what I would do is in exam one, I'd generally deal with fractions. Um, but in exam two, often you're given horrible numbers that only simplify to decimals by, in your calculator. Um, but yeah, generally try keep them in fractions, um, especially even in exam two, because they will ask you, like you guys, when you guys do exams, you'll probably see this little like text section at the start, which says, give your answers in exact form unless specified, right? Sometimes in the probability section, they'll ask your answers to four decimal places. Um, but most times when nothing is specified, you need to be giving your answer in exact value or in fractions, right? So keep that in mind when doing these questions. Um, but fractions are just easier to deal with, especially when you don't have a calculator on hand. There are some exceptions, though. Um, another thing with probability is that... Um, that it needs to, you know, the, the probability of an event happening can only be between from, from zero to one, 
right? Which makes sense. Zero being impossible, you can't you can't be you know less said like you, you can't be less likely than impossible, right? Um, and one is certain. You, you can't be more possible than than certain, right? If something is going to happen, there's no way like you know there, there's no like way to increase that chance from one hundred percent, right? Um, another thing is that this is just sort of complicated um, sort of symbols that you guys will see in the questions. But basically, this sign here um, is sigma, right? Um, for those of you who haven't seen it, basically just means the sum of, right? So if I have, you know, like maybe the sigma of some set, that just means you're just adding every value in that set, right? So maybe, you know, the, the sum of some, you know, like the sum of n i, where n is like a set of uh, where i is equal to 1. Maybe like you know when when n is like a set of one, two, and three, right? This is the notation is not entirely correct, but hopefully this will help you get a gist of it. You're just doing one plus two plus three, right? It's not entirely correct, but um, that's just the gist of it, right? You're just summing all the probabilities up, or summing all the values in that set up. And so what this what this whole statement is saying is that the sum of all the the, the probabilities must add up to one, right? So if I have you know like two events, um, so if I have an event, like the probability of getting um, heads and the probability of getting tails, well, they both need to add up to um, one, right? Like, it can't be like this, right? Because this only adds up to 0.7, and that doesn't explain what happens, you know, the 30% time, right? If I flip a coin, I'm only going to get heads or tails, right? It's so unlikely that it just lands on, like, you know, the... the the, the, the ridged part of the coin, right? So for simplicity, it's always going to be heads or tails, right? So it doesn't make sense that, head, you know, heads or tails only occurs 70% of the time, right? Which is why this needs to also be 0.5. All right, hopefully that makes sense. So all the events, the probability of all events needs to sum to one. Um, this is just that um, sort of displayed on a... Um, Scale, right? Zero is impossible. Um, one is certain. Um, these are just general terms that you don't really need to know, but I think it's a good way to sort of um, describe what's happening in an intuitive sense. Okay, let's just revise some key terms for probability. And I'm sure you guys would have seen these terms before, but I think it's a good idea to recap them before, you know, diving into three, four probability. So a random experiment is, you know, an experiment with a random outcome. So let's say you have a jar or, you know, like a, like a bag of socks, right? You have like 20 different types of socks with 20 different colors. You just put your hand in. You're not looking. You're just, you know, digging around, pulling out a sock. That's entirely random, right? Outcome is the result of a random experiment. You know, the, the color of the sock, or in this case, the color of the jelly bean. Sample space is every possible outcome of a random experiment. So maybe um, in, in my bag of jelly beans or in my, my bag of socks, I have socks that are colored red, blue, and green. So the sample space would be pulling out a red sock, pulling out a green sock, or pulling out a whatever other color I said. Um, and an event is a single outcome. So for example, if I pull out a, um, uh, like a, like a green sock, that is an event, right? Also, let's say I'm interested in the probability of pulling out 10 green socks or um, like five green socks in a row. Pulling out those five green socks in a row is, is also an event. Okay. Um, another thing that's super important with probability is set notation. I'm sure you guys would have come up with union and intersection before. Um, and it's really useful to explain them in terms of Venn diagram. But it's also, you, know, you probably would have seen them with function notation as well. Um, so A intersection B is a list of outcomes that are both in A and B. So what that means is if I have a Venn diagram of A and B, the intersection is that red area that I've shaded. Union is A or B, right? So it's, a, it's you know, it's whatever is in A and it's or it's whatever is in B. So it's just, you know, whatever's contained in the Venn diagram, right? So intersection, it's Good to think about it as like an and thing where um so you can see here or an and so it's and whereas union is an or sort of statement right 
to one or the other in union, or it has to be, you know, both of them together in the intersection. With union, we have this really nifty um, rule, sort of, um, that you that you can use to sort of calculate um, what this is. There's a cool proof you can sort of do with the Venn diagrams, and I'll sort of go through that now. So if I have, you know, two Venn diagrams, like so, if I want to work out what the total area is covered between them, but I only know the probability of A, the probability of B, and, you know, the intersection between them, if I want to work out the, the union, well, it's, it's sort of useful to, like, split it up into two sort of Venn diagrams, or two, two set circles, sorry. Um, so I'm going to split this up into two circles. Let's just ignore the intersection at the moment, right? So I know what the probability of A is. I know what the probability of B is, right? And so I'm going to add those together, and that's what this is, right? I'm adding, I'm getting those two circles, and I'm adding them together, right? Now, when I do that, you'll notice that this section here and this section here, the sections that are going to form that intersection region, there's two of them, right? There's some of it contained in B and there's some of it contained in A. And so when I overlap them, I get sort of a doubling up, right? You can see my fingers are doubled over, right? So I get a doubling up. And to get rid of that double up, because that's not counted in a union, right? Like when you do a union of a set, you don't count double ups, right? So get rid of that double up, we subtract one of the intersections. So I have a double up and I subtract it and now I'm just left with, you know, A union B. Hopefully that makes sense. And then a complement is just the opposite, right? So everything, you know, A complement is everything that's not an A. Um, and we can also represent that by this sort of equation, um, which makes sense as well. So if, you know, the probability of A happening is like 0.8, well, the probability of anything but A happening, because it all needs to add up to 1 at the end of the day, so the probability of A happening and, and the probability that A is not happening must sum to 1, right? Um, because one of those events will happen, right? And so you just need to sort of reshuffle it, and then what you'll get is 1 minus 0.8, which is just 0.2. Okay, and a little bit more terms. Um, the, I know basic probability is just a lot of memorization, but trust, once you guys get to, you know, the cool stuff with discrete, binomial, and continuous, um, I think it's it's quite worth knowing these. Okay, um, I, I potentially had a lot of questions about mutually exclusive and independent, like what, what's the difference? So mutually exclusive is if they can't occur together, right? Um, for example, if that intersection is um, zero, right? So A intersection B is zero, right? So if I've got something like this. Um, independent events, on the other hand, um, are when one happening doesn't affect the chance of another happening. A really good example of that is something like um, me solving a Rubik's cube in you know, like like a minute or and and the probability that it rains, right? The it's it's likely that when I'm solving the Rubik's Cube, I'm inside my room and not affected by the rain. And me solving a Rubik's Cube faster or slower is not going to affect the chance that the rain happens. Right? So in that sense they are independent, right? Their probabilities aren't linked. Now if they're mutually exclusive, um it's it's one or the other. There's never an overlap. Um, for an example, um, maybe it's like playing cricket and it raining, right? Um, it's like when that intersection is zero, right? Then they're not, well, it's really unlikely that they're going to play cricket when it's raining. And, you know, let's just, for the sake of simplicity, let's say it's zero, right? Um, so if, if it's raining, they're not playing cricket. If it's uh, If they are playing cricket, it's not raining. So it's a bit of like a logic sort of puzzle, I guess. But um, mutually exclusive just means that there is no overlap. They're just two distinct events that can't, you know, it's like a yes or a no, right? Or it's an incorrect and a correct. Um, I mean, I guess you can be like sort of correct, but if we're just looking at correct and incorrect as two discrete sort of things, you can't be incorrect and correct. There's no overlap, right? Hopefully that makes sense. Um, but independent, it's just that, you know, the chance of one happening doesn't affect the chance of another happening. Um, now, cool thing with this is that if you have two mutually exclusive events, their union, right, the union of A and B is just probability of A plus the probability of 
b, right? We don't have to subtract the a union b because that's just equal to zero, right? So it's, it's sort of pointless to represent that. Um, now, a condition with independent events, right, as you guys can see here, is that their intersection is a multiplication of each other, right? So it's just the probability of A times the probability of B if A and B are independent. So a super common question type I've seen is that they'll give you two, um, you know, two events. They'll say that the probability of this happening is like 0.8 and the probability of this happening is 0.2. Are these events independent or not? Um, and maybe they'll, they'll also tell you the probability of like an intersection. So for example, the probability of A is 0.8, probability of B is 0.2, and their intersection, A intersection B is equal to 0.16, right? The way you'd prove that, you know, these two are independent events is you'd throw it into this equation. And then you'd have to show that A union B is equal to these two multiplied. I mean, A intersection B is equal to 0.8 times 0.2, which it is. So in this case, A and B are independent. But sometimes you can have a case where, you know, it's like um, A is 0.8 again, B is also 0.2, but their intersection might be like 0.05. Obviously, in this case, when you multiply 0.8 by 0.2, you don't get 0.05. So in the, in the second case here, they are dependent events. Okay, cool. Um, so we can also show that with a Venn diagram, which I've already sort of done. Um, we can, you know, we can say that this area is A, this area is B, right? And when I do this, and when I want to show how this rule works, you can see that I've scribbled in this area twice, right? So I want to subtract that area again. Sort of already been through that. Um, it's always a good idea when you get a sample space of multiple events, if you can represent it with a Venn diagram, just because it'll make doing those calculations a bit easier, it's always a good idea to take a load off your brain, more or less, right? You don't want to juggle so many things in your brain. That's just a recipe for silly mistakes. Um, okay, let's talk about conditional probability. Conditional probability, super common, pops up everywhere. Um, really nice question type. Um, but you know, enough about me talking about the question type and how it's nice. Let's talk about how we can do these. So what does conditional probability mean? It's the probability given a condition, right? Which sounds like a cyclic definition, but let's say, um, you know, the probability that it rains given that it rained yesterday, right? So I'm giving you an extra piece of information to sort of deal with, right? And that you know, generally works in a sense that when the event that occurred previously changes the, the event of, you know, the, the probability of a new event occurring, right? So, for example, in this, in this you know, example here, you're going to roll a die, and I tell you it's an even number. So what's the probability that's a four? Well, let's say it's a six-sided die. The sample space of this um, die is one, two, or dice, sorry, um, four, five, and six, right? So that's the, the sample space of all the, the, all the possible numbers. Now I tell you that it's an even number, right? So all the even numbers are two, four, and six. Now, if I wanna work out the probability that it's four, so the probability that it's a four, given that all of these are even, right? Is, well, I look at how many times four happens in the original set. Well, that's just, and how many times it happens in the second set. I look at their intersection. In both, it only occurs once. In the top, I have one, right? which makes sense. Probability of getting a four on a six-sided dice is one, right? just rolling it randomly. But it's not one and six because I've, de I've changed that sample space. I've decreased it. right? I've taken it from you know just one to six. I've said, well, it has to be an even number. So it's either two, four, or six. And so there's three possible outcomes. right? So I write that down. So the probability of getting four, given that it's an even number, is one over three. And so that's nicely summarized in this rule here. So A given B, right? So it's written as A given B um, is equal to the, um, that's meant to be up there, but I'll rewrite it so it makes more sense. So the probability of A given B is equal to the probability that A intersection, or the probability of A intersecting with B divided by the new narrowed down sample space, which is given by probability of B. Also, some of you guys would have noticed that I'm writing it, you know, I'm not writing 
PR, I'm just running P, doesn't matter, either or they're the same. Um, at university, for some reason, we were just taught to write it with a P. Um, it, it doesn't really matter, I guess. Um, I'd recommend just doing whatever your teacher does. Um, this is the way I've done it, but either or I think is fine. Um, and considering we did it at uni, I hope it's okay. Um, okay. All right, cool. All right. Um, another way we can display things apart from a Venn diagram is known as a Kano map. So Kano maps aren't explicitly on the study design. I want to make that clear, but I think they're a really good way of sort of representing these questions. And they definitely sort of really helped me during my um, exam. There was like the need to do a Kano map. And um, a lot of my friends didn't love that question. Um, I didn't like that question either, but a Kano map sort of helped me get through it. Okay, so what is a Kano map um, or probability table, right? It's what we represent all our possible events. And it's, it's really convenient for two events, but you can do it for multiple events, right? So you can maybe have A, B, C, right? You just need to add an extra sort of layer to it. Um, so these boxes are just the events, right? And the boxes that sort of like intersect with them are their like literal intersections, right? So this box here is A intersection B. Here is A intersecting with not B. Here is not A intersecting with um, not B, and so on. So when these two add, right, we get the probability of B, right? The probability of um, A intersecting with B and the probability that not A intersects with B. Both of that is going to give the total sum of B, right? And same here, right? Those sum up to equal this. And then these two sum up to equal the probability of A, and these two sum up to equal the probability of A. And nicely, we expect that it all sums up to 1, right? Because B and not B must sum up to 1, and A and not A must also sum to 1. Okay, um, hopefully that makes some sense. So let's have a go at using it on a question. So the probably the probability that Joe rides his bike to work and it is sunny is 0.1. So we've got two events that we can sort of characterize here. One event is that it's sunny. The other event is that Joe rides his bike to work, right? So I'm going to call that S and B. Um, with probability questions, it's always helped me to, to sort of highlight everything, annotate everything, just break it down from, you know, instead of this big slab of text, right, that's really annoying to read, just break, breaking it down to key pieces of information that you need and not all the, the, the random stuff. Like you don't need to know what the guy's name is, right? What you need to know is the two events, right, and the numbers. So the probability that Joe rides his bike to work and it is sunny, right, and, okay. Um, so that's the intersection event between the B intersection S is equal to 0.1. So I'm going to write that in my table, 0.1 here. The probability that it isn't sunny, so not sunny, and the probability that Joe rides his bike, so S intersection, um, not S, sorry, intersection B is 0.7. Um, so 0.7 here. Using a Kano map, what is the probability that on any given day he doesn't ride his bike and it isn't sunny? Okay, so how can I do this? Well, here is 1. Um, and so this is just 0.1 plus 0.7 is equal to 0.8, right? 1 minus 0.8 is equal to 0.2. Um, now let's see if the question has given us any additional information. Um, the probability that Joe rides his bike to work and it is sunny um, is 0.1. Okay. Um, the probability that it isn't sunny. Um, oh, okay. I think I've misread the question, um, which which happens. I've realized that there was, like, from what I looked at, there was insufficient um, information to answer the question, um, which is kind of unlucky, but that's fine. So I think it said the probability that it isn't sunny is 0.6. So what this is, is not what I've written out here. Ooh, sorry, just zoomed in. I think this is just S, the probability of not S is equal to um, 0.6. And the probability of B is equal to 0.7. That's my bad. Um, I'll quickly rub this out. Um, but yeah, there you go. You guys can see just how easy it is to misread these probability questions, you know, lose a couple marks. So it's always a really good idea 
after you, you know, tried answering the question, you sort of stuck, go back to the question straight away and try work out what mistake you've made. Okay, I still think this is correct, right? The intersection between B and S. Um, so the probability of B is 0.7. The probability of not S is 0.6. Right? So I, I think this is a little bit more plausible and easier to work out. So just one uh, minus 0.6 here would give me 0.4 for the other event. And here is just 0.3, right? Because 0.7 plus 0.3 sums to 1. Here, I just need to do um, 0.7 minus 0.1. So 0.7 minus 0.1. And that's equal to 0.6. Um, which I think is going to give me zero here, right? If I haven't done that correctly. And so here should be left with 0.3. Um, if I made any mistakes, by the way, with any of these sorts of questions, just throw a message in chat. Um, you know, yeah. Okay. And this is just going to go through that, um, you know, sort of worked out. Um, but hopefully that makes a bit of sense. Okay. Um, and so then we can use this table to help us answer questions, right? This table isn't just for the sake of making it, it's also for the sake of helping us answer questions. So they've said, it is sunny today. What is the probability that Joe rides his bike? Um, so sunny intersecting with riding bike should be um, 0.1, right? But what it's also important to know is that they've sort of told us a condition. They've given us the condition that it is sunny today, right? So this implies conditional, right? Because they've, they've given us an extra piece of information. So what we need to do is we need to use our conditional probability equa equation. So riding bike, given that it's S, right? Given that it's sunny. So on the top, we want to know the intersection between B and S. And I said that was 0.1. So we write 0.1. The probability that it's sunny is 0.4. And so simplifying it, we'll just give one on four um, or a quarter or 0.25. But yeah, I've always found these tables to be helpful for these conditional probability questions, mainly. Okay, let's talk a bit about independent events again. So, like I mentioned, um, if you know two independent events are occurring, the, the probability of one happening doesn't affect, affect the probability of another happening. So if I've got um, the probability of, you know, like a conditional probability, so I'm saying probability of B given A, that's, you know, the probability of B occurring is not going to affect the chance of you know, the probability of A. So that doesn't affect anything. Um, this also applies, right? So the probability of A intersection B is equal to the probability of A, um, oh, sorry, the probability of A intersection B divided by probability of B is equal to probability of A, right? Which makes sense from our equation earlier, right? If you remember, I think maybe two slides ago, I might have quoted the same equation there. Um, you know, yeah, see, that's derived from the previous one. Um, just simply because they're they're like they're not conditionally linked, right? Um, if I tell you that, you know, in like the last scenario, right, clearly there was some link between um the, the weather, like it being sunny or not, and the person riding the bike. But if we go back to my example of me solving a Rubik's Cube in X amount of time, maybe like a minute, I think is what I said, and it raining outside, those are clearly not linked events. So given that it is raining. The probability of me solving my Rubik's cube in less than a minute doesn't change, right? Okay, mutually exclusive. This is what it looks like on a Venn diagram. I sort of already mentioned that their union is just adding the probability, you know, of A and B together. Oh, okay, cool. All right, another technique to know is tree diagrams. So, what's a tree diagram? Um, it's a map of all possible events, right? Um, they're generally useful for two to three events um, and not anything more than that. So event A is that first branch and then event B is the second branch, right? And it's all given in conditional probabilities, right? Because what this is saying is that B happens given that A already happened, right? And so from there, we can multiply the probability of, the, of these two things, right, to give us their intersections. Okay, hopefully that makes some sense. Um, another useful note to, uh, to know is that if you have something um, with the words and, so if I want something to happen and another thing to happen, so for example, the probability of me solving a Ruby's cube in less than a minute and the probability of it raining, 
then I multiply them together. When we use or, so the probability of me solving a Rubik's Cube in less than one minute or it raining, well, for that, you use plus. And hopefully these and and or sort of things ring a bell. And is an intersection, right? And is intersection. And or is union. So general rule of thumb, if you see intersection, you're multiplying. If you see union, you're adding. But remember the intersection multiplying thing only works for independent events. Okay, random variables, what are they? Um, a random variable more or less is a variable that's defined um, through like a function, right? It, but this function is defined on the outcome of an experiment, right? So it's a little bit, comp a little bit more complicated than your standard variable, but you know, it's just complicated terminology for something that's you know reasonably understandable. So, so an example here is that if you flip a coin three times, um, your outcome right is going to be the set of three coin tosses. That's either going to be a heads or a tails, right? And so you can make a random variable, right? And that random variable would be something like I said earlier, as you know the number of heads that are going to pop up. Right. Or maybe the, the random variable from my example is the probability that I solve a Rubik's Cube in less than a minute. Maybe I, I tried doing it, like scramble it five times, try solving it five times. Um, and so the random variable could be, you know, solving it in less than a minute. Um, and here are just a couple examples of some random variables. Right. Um, so hopefully that sort of makes sense. Um, I would recommend throwing these definitions on your bound reference, just in case you have a mind blank in the exam, but um, I would really want you guys to memorize this sort of stuff. Okay, um, with random variables, um, they are you know generally represented with X, but I've used different variables all the time, um, especially for spec, you sometimes you get like you know a few different variables. So you can just use different letters. It doesn't actually matter. It's just an arbitrary thing that we choose. Same with like f of x, right? You can you really use any variable you want, but it's just, you know, x seems to be the favorite variable for mathematicians in methods anyways. So um what you know how what what that means, like how how is it represented? Um Capital X is the random variable, whereas two is like the particular event, right? So the probability, like, you know, the probability of X is equal to two is just means that the probability that our outcome is equal to two, right? Um, you know, X is equal to green is the probability of outcome is equal to some, you know, defined thing known as green. Okay, um, mean, median, and mode. These are definitely things you guys have you know, seen before. But I'm going to give it a little bit of a different twist on them, especially in discrete um, and the, the other stuff that's come. Um, so mean, uh, please remember this symbol. It's how we represent it in methods. Um, that's called a mu. Um, the way I usually write it is just like a like a u, but I start like you know with like a, a a tail out the front, right? So the mean measures the center of the distribution, right? Um, and it's also known as the expected value. Hopefully this rings a bell to an integration sort of technique that we talked about earlier, or the average value of a function. Um, when we talk about continuous um, probability, this can be slightly, this can be pretty important. So keep that in mind. Um, it's also denoted by e of x, and e of x just means the, expe the expected value of x, right? It's because the average and the expectation are about the same. The median. Um, is that is the value that there is 50% um, of the values lie above it and 50% lies below it. So if I have, you know, one, two, three, four, and five, the probability of one occurring might be point um, two, the probability of two occurring might be point two, and the probability of three occurring is point one. So then the median value is point three because 50% of the probability lies sort of below it, 50% lies above it, less, right? So that's a median. Right, um, so in this case, you've got one, two, two, and five. Two is the most likely common thing, so it's it, it's also in smack bang in the middle, so that's the median. Mode is the most frequently occurring x value, or event value. So in the case of the, the, the last thing, the last one is also the mode, right? Um, it's gonna be two because it occurs the most, right? The, the value of x, which has the highest probability, right? So maybe this is like 0.05, 0.05, and maybe there's a bunch of you know 
more events of just 0.05 until it all adds up to one. So then, you know, the the mode would either be one or two because it has the highest probability of occurring. If that makes sense. Um, the mean, this is a little bit of a um, application style question that they can ask you primarily in your SACs. Um, sometimes they can ask you what which of the mean median mode is the best definition of the center, right? And I think a lot of people would just go ahead and straight away say the mean, right? That Because it's the average, right? But the problem with mean is that it's not robust. And what I mean by robust is that it can be affected, or not robust, sorry. What I mean by not robust is that it can be affected really easily by outliers, right? If I have, you know, a couple numbers, one, two, and three, and also 0 0.00001, the mean is going to be so much lower than what one, two, and three actually are, right? Or if I have one, two, two, and five, and I don't know, like, 0 0.0001, again, the, the mean is just going to be dragged down, right? Um, but the median and the mode are just better sort of definitions of a center, right? The mode is going to obviously choose two, which is probably closer to, to the center of the distribution, and same with the median. Hopefully that makes sense. Um, sort of a side note, um, but regardless, very important to understand, I think. Okay. How can we measure the spread of you know our values, right? Obviously, after we do an experiment, we're gonna get a bunch of different values, right? How do we measure you know the distance between each value, like how each value varies with each other? And so that where that's where variance and standard deviation come in. So they're both measures of spread, right? So variance is given by the square of standard deviation, right? So we generally use variance to define a distribution. And we'll talk about defining distributions when we talk about binomial and normal, right? And standard deviation is usually denoted with an SD or lowercase sigma. You probably remember me talking, calling this sigma. That's uppercase, and this is just a lowercase sigma. So um, the variance can also be denoted as sigma squared, right? Because var of x is equal to sigma squared, right? From, from that. Um, variance is also represented with variance of whatever va variable. So if your event is... Um, shown by y, you'd be dealing with var of y and not var of x, okay? Um, and standard deviation is sd or sigma. So um, standard deviation is always the square root of variance. So that says that variance must always be greater than or equal to zero, right? Because we can't take the square root of negative number in methods. Okay, let's get on to discrete probability, right? So we've sort of covered um, you know, all the basic stuff. Now it's to get time to get into the nitty gritty. All right. Um, what are discrete random variables? Well, discrete random variables has a few key properties. So it can only take countable values or whole numbers or, you know, natural numbers, right? Or integers. Um, actually, I don't know if the last part came up in the recording. Um, so natural numbers or integers. Um, the probability of all of them need to sum to one, right? Just before the basic probability sort of thing, all probabilities need to add up to one in you know the total event or sample space. So I'll give you guys um, a couple seconds to have a read of this um, and maybe you know choose um, which of these could be um, a discrete variable. So hopefully you guys type, have typed your answer into chat, and I'm going to sort of talk through each one, right? So the number of siblings, obviously, you know, that is a whole number, right? You can't have one and a half siblings, right? Same with houses. You can't have one and a half houses. But with height, that's not so clear, right? So you can obviously have one and a half centimeters or one and a half point, you know, 1.5 point, 1.5222 occurring, right? And if you went and arranged people in your class based on height, right, you'll see that you'll get like, you know, like a, like sort of like a spectrum of heights, right? You're not going to get a defined groups. Maybe with eye, like with eye color, you will definitely get defined groups. You will have a group of people who are, who are definitely, um, you know, brown eyed and def definitely a group of people who are green eyed, right? But with height, if you choose a particular value in height, maybe like 181.2 centimeters, you'll be lucky to find one person with that height. That, that probability in a large population would be really close to zero, right? So with height, you'll probably be defining it by, you know, greater than 180 centimeters or less than 180 centimeters. And that's where you can create groups, 
but you're not choosing exact value, you're choosing a range. So hopefully that makes sense. With, with discrete random variables, we can choose large or exact groups. Okay, so this is what a you know probably discrete probability table would look like, right? So we have our variable name here, and we have the you know, the probability sort of being like shown there as well. So x can take up the values of zero, one, two, three, four, five, and each with its corresponding probabilities here, right? So all of these must sum to one, which we can see, and all of them must be between zero and one. They can't be negative. They can't be greater than one. Okay. Now, if we look at what's known as a probability mass function, which is just fancy speak for showing the probability on a graph, we can see that it comes in discrete lines. There's no in between, right? I can't be between zero and one. I can't be between one and two. There's no smooth curve, right? It still shows, you know, like a center, it still shows a median, right? But there's no smooth curve. You can only be one, two, three, four, or five, right? Um, you need to know how to draw out these tables, by the way. Always have x and the outcomes on the top and the probabilities on the bottom. Okay, how can we use this to determine probability, right? Because that's what we want to know. That's how we want to answer these questions. So we can determine it straight from the table, right? So if I read off the table and I look for probability of x is equal to 3, you just look at that. That tells me it's 0.3. There we go. That's my answer. But we can also, you know, work out a range of probability values. For example, if I want to calculate the probability that x is greater than 2, maybe, you know, don't have a look at that, have a pause, have a think, maybe. Um, if we look at it, what we're doing is it's x not inclusive to, of 2, right? So I can't include 2, so I scribble that out in my mind. So what I'm doing is I'm doing 0.3 plus 0.4, right? So 0.3 plus 0.4, and that's just equal to 0.7. Um, so how can we work out mean, median, and mode for this probability table? I sort of did a small example earlier, right? But it wasn't in too much detail. So let's start with median and mode, right? They're the easiest ones to work out. The median is the middle number. We want 50% of values greater than the median, right? So oh, should I reveal that? I want you guys to have a sort of think about, you know, which ones here could be the median, which ones could be the mode. So you want to add all these up and work out where that 50% mark lies for the median, right? So we're gonna go, the way I like to start is I start on the left and I just keep adding until I get to 0.5. So I have 0 0.1 plus 0.2, which is 0.3 plus 0.16. So that's 0 0.3 plus 0.16, which is 0 0.49, oh, 46, sorry. Um, and then I can add the 0.24 and that's gonna be greater than 0.5, right? So clearly that median is in between three and four, but since I'm dealing with discrete variables, I can't have a thing between three and four. So I'm gonna say four is my median, right? Because 50% lies below and about 50% lies above, right? And to work out the mode, I want the most popular number or the, the number with the highest percentage chance of happening. If I look at these, 0.24 has the highest chance of occurring. And so then that must be the mode, right? And so, you know, your answers for both A and B are four. But how do we work out the mean? So with the mean, there's actually a formula to, to do, right? And that changes based on what sort of distribution it is, whether it be binomial, continuous, or normal, or, or discrete, we have a different equation to use. So when we're using a table, we want to use this freaky looking formula, right? What this says is you want to take every single X value, multiply by its probability, then add it together. Right, so the way you'd read it, like I just said, sum of x multiplied by its corresponding probability. So um, let's try to work out the mean for this, right? So how we would do that is I'd multiply these two values together, then add that to these two values together, and then add it to these two, and add it to these two. Why do we multiply by the probability? Well, in general, right, when we want to work out the average, we want to take up all the you know all the all the values, add them together, divided by the total number of you know, the, the chance of that value. Oh, so, sorry, let me rephrase that. If we want to work out the average value of a, a set, right, or a sample space, we sum up all those numbers and then we divide it by the total number of those things happening, right? The number of like numbers in that set. But with this distribution table, we don't know anything about the set. We only have the probabilities. 
So by multiplying the probability by you know the event number or the outcome, what we're doing is we're weighting that outcome, right? We're weighting it with its probability, which is why we do it like so. If that makes sense. So the number with the, you know the highest um, probability is going to be weighted more heavily. So it's more likely that that will be the dominating value when it comes to the mean. By dominating, I mean that 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 means that the average is going to be closer to that value. And so you can see here, all I've done is 1 times 0.1 plus 2 times 0.2 plus 3 times 0.3 plus 4 times 0.4. And using that, the mean has worked out to be 3, right? which is pretty neat. Okay, how can we work out variance and standard deviation? Sorry, that's sort of cut off. Hopefully it's still readable. So with variance, right? Um, again, it's like the mean, it changes based on the sort of, you know, um, distribution it's in. But for discrete, it's also really ugly, right? It's e of x squared minus e of x squared, right? So we're first doing, what this is, is the expectation or the expected value of x squared minus the expected value of x whole thing squared. So if you guys remember e of x is just equal to the mean. Right, so how do I work out e of x squared? Um, and it's not just the mean squared, okay? e of x squared is that we need to make a new probability distribution table with every value squared, and then we just work it out as per normal. So we sum up the squares of the variables and their respective probabilities, then we square the mean. So how would this work out to be? I'll give you guys a couple seconds, maybe have a crack, um, but let's try to work out the variable. Um, variant, sorry. So how does e of x squared work? Well, all we do is we just square these values here, right? And then we still multiply them. Um, what I like to do is make a separate table for this, right? So um, on top or on bottom, I'd make an x squared set. And so then I'd just write 1 squared, 2 squared, 3 squared, and 4 squared. Obviously, I can do 4 squared in my head, and that's not the issue. What is the issue is that maybe I might make a silly mistake, right? So again, I don't want to do any thinking more or less. I want to put it all on paper. So I'm not juggling variables in my head. And by not juggling variables in my head, I'm not screwing things up, right? So I'm just going to you know write things like so. And then I need to, to work out e of x squared. I just do the normal um, calculation. I'm just multiplying them together like so. And we get 10, right? Um, and then to calculate the you know what e of x whole thing squared is, that e of x squared like this is just the mean squared. So what we worked out last time, right? So that's just three. We're squaring it. So we apply it to the equation, and we get ten minus three squared, which is ten minus nine, and we get one. Um, and if I want to work out my standard deviation from this, right? My standard deviation is just the square root of variance, and my, so my standard deviation is just 1 here as well. Okay, let's have a go at this question. I'll give you guys a couple seconds, have a crack, maybe pause it, type your solution in chat. Um, only reason I say type your solution in chat is so that you guys sort of lock in your answer and get a very accurate reading of how you guys went. Um, maybe also see how other people's, um, what other people also thought was the answer. Um, just because, you know, it can, it can like, even if other people or you get the answer wrong, there's nothing wrong with that, right? Um, what I want to reinforce is that getting a question wrong isn't, you know, like, oh my god, I suck. It's more a learning experience, right? It's getting a question wrong is probably the best way to improve. Um, because when you when you see what went, when, what went wrong for yourself or what went wrong for others, you can sort of see where they've come from or where you've come from as well in terms of thought process. And you can sort of refine it, right? Um, so you can sort of refine that process. Um, and you can also notice where your mistakes are coming from and eliminate those mistakes. Okay, um, enough about me rambling about that. So a discrete random variable x has the probability function, probability of x is equal to k. Um, and that function is given by, you know, this, this gross equation, Ooh, that gross equation there, where 1 minus p to the power k times p um, where k is a non-negative integer. The probability of x is greater than 1 is equal to... Okay, so we've got to try and work this out. So we've got a discrete random variable. That's the first thing I want to highlight, right? You can only, you know, I don't have to deal with 1, 1 1.5, 1.75, right? I'm just dealing with 1, 2, 3, and 4, right? 
Um, also, it's important to note that since I'm dealing with x is greater than 1, right, that's also equal to x is greater than or equal to 2, right, because there's no 1.5 sort of terms that we're talking about, right? So what I want to do is, and also the other thing to note is that I don't know the upper bound, right? This could this could have 10 um, possible, you know, um, values. So maybe it goes 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. Maybe it goes to 12. Maybe it goes to 13. I don't know where that upper bound is, right? So I can't just keep adding things. What I do know is that 1 minus probability of x, so 1 minus probability of x is less than 1, um, is sort of like the flip, right? This is just equal to the probability of x is less than 1, right? So I can sort of use that to, to work this out, which is what I've done here, right? Um, so I've written it out like so. Um, so the probability of x is greater than, oh, sorry. That is not what I meant to write. I was meant to write that the probability of x is greater than 1, right, as said above, is equal to the probability of x is greater than or equal to 2. If x is greater than or equal to 2, it's every value in that set except x is equal to 0 and x is equal to 1, which is why I subtract that here from 1, right, everything but that, right? So 1 minus that. So I substitute in um, k is equal to 0 and k is equal to 1, and so after doing that, I can um, oh, quickly uh, rub this out. So after doing that, I can sort of sub everything in um, and work it out from there. So my answer here would be E. This is definitely a tricky question. Um, so one another thing I'd recommend um, adding into your bound reference is these tricky questions. Um, it's reasonably useful to add in tricky questions into your bound reference. So if you get a similar question on your actual exam, you can sort of just flick back and refer to the method you use to solve that question as well. Okay, so that's all there is really with discrete probability. It's just a lot of practice. Um, it's good to expose yourself to a variety of question types. Like this is a really tough question. Um, and you know, I don't think I've um, seen anything like this outside of Vika. Um, so yeah, very good question to do that. Okay, so let's now talk about binomial distributions um, and Bernoulli sequences. So what is a Bernoulli sequence or what even is a binomial distribution? So by meaning two. Um, so a Bernoulli sequence follows this thing known as a binomial distribution, but I'll talk about that in a bit. Let's sort of focus on Bernoulli sequences. So a Bernoulli sequence has a certain rule, right? So any Bernoulli sequence has two outcomes, right? And we can define these outcomes as a success or a failure. For example, let's say I flip a coin, right? And let's say I said getting tails is success and getting a heads on the coin is failure, right? So you two distinct outcomes, I can easily define them as successes or failures, right? And every time I flip that coin, the probability is the same. Every trial needs to have a constant probability. And each failure is also a constant probability. So a coin is really good for this because regardless of the number of times I flip that coin, that probability isn't going to change, hopefully. And these trials must also be independent. So the probability of the first trial must not affect the probability of the second trial. Um, this is quite a like, sort of, you know, a, a lot of conditions to meet, but um, they're, you know, nice conditions to have because they let us uh, like put in place a pattern more or less. Um, like I said, a sequence of coin tosses, each head is a success or, you know, and each toss is independent, right? So multiple Bernoulli sequences allow us to build what's known as a binomial distribution. So, um, you know, if X is the number of successes in a Bernoulli sequence um, with a fixed success of probability P, then we call that sequence a binomial random variable. Binomial, again, meaning two possible outcomes. And a binomial random variable will have a binomial distribution. So we always write out these binomial random values as follow, right? So we write x, and then we write that squiggly line, um, bi for binomial. And then we always write the number of trials first, represented by n, comma, p. And these are two important variables when it comes to working out the binomial distribution. Um, the order doesn't matter in which these events occur, right? because they're all independent from each other. So the order doesn't matter. And so we use this thing known as combinations or combinatorics, right? Um, combinatorics, sorry. Um, so combinations, how do we do them? We, well, we do them with this thing called a factorial. So n factorial is given by n times n minus 1 times n minus 2 
and so on until it equals 1. For example, the factorial of 4 is 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. Um, 0 factorial is equal to 1, so that's why it's not included here. So combinations don't actually care about order, right? So it's shown as NCR, so number of people to choose from possible groups, right? So, for example, if I want to choose three people from this lecture, how many groups can I choose? I'll let you guys sort of figure this out. Um, maybe you've done um, this sort of stuff before. If you haven't seen it before, that's all good. So if you're entirely lost right now, that's fine. I'm going to go through that. Um, so let's look at this. So 10 people um, touch on when they board a tram and four are caught. How many different combinations of people are possible? So we're going to say that the number of people right, possible are 10, right? And the groups are four, right? So four of these, so I'm choosing four from 10. How many ways can I choose four from 10? That's what this is asking, right? So you read this as 10 choose four. So C for choose. So I just do, I just chuck it into the equation. So 10 factorial divided by four factorial times 10 minus four factorial. Um, and so that's just this. Now, if you leave things in factorials, you can cancel them out. So 10 times nine times eight times six factorial. So then these six factorials can cancel out. And so you're left with 10 times nine times eight divided by four times three times two. So it's always good to cancel out where you can. So um, the four and the two are gonna cancel out with the eight, and the three and the nine are gonna cancel out to make three. So it's just 10 times three, which is equal to 30. And so we can put this all together with probability to form the binomial formula, right? Where X tells you the number of successes you have, P is the probability of success, and N is the number of trials. Okay, so this reads basically as um, you know number of, number of successes given n number of trials times the probability of successes times the probability of no successes. Right, this here is the number of times, so it's n minus x, right, which is the number of times the number of failures. Right, and this only works because each event is independent. So what's happening is like, you know, the, the first, like, you know, I, for example, in five, I get four successes. So then I have to do the probability of success times one, times two, times three, oh, like times four, right? Like um, success once and twice and three and four, right? Hence they multiply. If that makes sense because it's and, right? And I also multiply by the chance of one failure. So it's one minus p once, okay? Hopefully that makes sense, which is why it simplifies to be like five c4 p to the power um, four times one minus p to the power five minus four, right? Let's do a question. So um, let's say, you know, Dr. Strange found that Iron Man has a 90% chance of dying over all possible timelines. Let's say we take 10 random timelines. What is the probability that Iron Man dies in every timeline? And what is the probability he dies in a half? Um, I'll give you guys some time to think about it. Have a, have a pause, maybe. Um, see how you go. Um, but in the meantime, I'll work it out. So generally, my first step... Oh, let me just quickly have some water. My first step, generally, is to set up my variable. Right? And so I'm going to write, the, the reason I do this, by the way, is so then I have all the val values I need in a nice small package, as opposed to a slab of text. The only two things I really need, apart from this Iron Man garbage, well, I don't need the Iron Man garbage, sorry. What I do need is the 0.9 from the 90% chance. So the probability of dying is 0.9. That's what we've defined as a success, right? That Because we're trying to find when Iron Man dies. Right? So the probability of death is success. Sometimes the probability that they give you is not the probability of a success. So you've got to be really careful with that, right? And then we want to take 10 random variables, and so n is equal to 10, okay? So um, we have x is binomially distributed with n is equal to 10, with the probability 0.9. So let's say we want to work out the probability he dies in, in 10 random timelines. Again, order doesn't matter here. It doesn't matter in what order he dies or in which order of timelines checked he dies. Just it needs to matter that it happens, you know, out of the 10 times it happens five. Well, you know, um, he dies in half, right? That's what we're working out first. So x is equal to five out of 10, that's, that's half. This is just 
um, 10 choose 5, right? It's the same thing as the factorial, like the combinations. Um, so I subs that into my NCR equation. Um, I'm calling it an NCR equation because it's like this, right? Um, and then I, you know, sub everything else into my binomial equation. And I get 0 0.001 to three decimal places. Now, um, since this, is, this didn't really ask for any decimal places, it's probably better to just give it as an exact value. Okay. Um, now let's go to a new question. We, again, we take 10 random timelines. What is the probability that Iron Man dies? Well, also, I forgot to talk about what is the probability that Iron Man dies in every timeline? In this case, you do probability of x is equal to 10, right? So 10 by 10 times 0 0.9 to the power 10. Um, and here it's 0 0.1 times 10 right, to, the, to the power 10 minus 10, which just cancels out, right? Now, if we go back to our formula for NCR, um, Akil, sorry, if I have two of the same numbers, so if, it, if it's got 10 choose 10, well, by common sense, there's only one possible way to choose 10 choose 10, right? I just need to choose all of them. I can show that mathematically by this. So 10 factorial divided by 10 factorial times 10 times minus 10 factorial. And that's just equal to one because these cancel out. That's equal to zero and zero factorial is equal to one, right? Um, sorry, I went back a little bit. And so really this is just equal to is equal to 10 or dies in all timelines is just equal to 0 0.9 to the power 10 which is the same as saying he dies in timeline 1 and dies in timeline 2 and dies in timeline 3 and so on right i've just multiplied 0 0.9 by 10 0 0.9 by itself 10 times cool hopefully that makes sense okay so we take 10 random timelines what is the probability that iron man dies in less than two timelines so again i want to write out what my variable is right? And now I've got the probability of x is less than 2, right? This is also the same as the probability of x is less than or equal to 1, because it's a discrete sort of distribution. Remember, binomial is discrete. So keep that in mind, so discrete, right? So the probability of x is less than 1, um, which is also just equal to the probability of x is equal to 0 plus x is equal to 1. We can't have less than um, zero in this case, right? It doesn't make sense for him to die in negative one timelines. And now I just sub that into my binomial equation, right? Um, and this works out probably of x is equal to zero. And then I can work out probably of x is equal to one separately. And then from there, I sum them together, right? And that gives me my um, wanted value there. It's here, by the way. Okay. Um, what is the probability that he dies in at least one? So the probability of x is greater than or equal to one, so at least one. Again, same thing. Um, so there's two ways to do this question. Um, one is to add everything from one to ten, right? Um, but since we know all these outcomes, since it's just a probability distribution must sum to one, we can just do the complement. So I can do um, the probability of x is less than one, and do one minus of that, right? So this is just the complement of each other, right? It's a complement. Um, and, you know, the probability is x is less than 1 is just equal to the probability that x is equal to 0, right? Because it's discrete. And so that's where I get this from. And I worked out what x is equal to 0 was from the previous slide. And this is basically just 0, right? which is why we get 1.000 to four decimal places. Okay, so the binomial distribution has a different formula for mean and variance, um, and so this is as follows. Um, and also for, yeah, so for the mean, it's just the number of um, trials times the probability of that trial, which is quite nice, right? Um, it makes sense if you think about flipping a coin as well, right? The probability of flipping a coin is 0.5, Let's say I flip a coin um, uh, maybe like five times, so n is equal to five. The probability that I get tails is just going to be, you know, probability of 0.5 times five, right? Half of the times I'm going to get tails. So two and a half times I should be getting tails. 
which is kind of iffy, I guess, with a discrete um, sort of distribution. So that's either probably, it's probably better to just round up to three. To three. Um, for binomial distributions, the formula for variance is just NP times one minus P. So the, the expected variable or the expected value times the probability of the complement, more or less, right? Um, again, remember that um, the variance is equal to the standard deviation squared. Um, and so if I want to work out standard deviation, right, that's just equal to NP times one minus P, the square root of that, right? So these are quite important to know. They will get you to calculate this sort of stuff. So try not to get this confused with just normal discrete um, formulas. Um, it does follow an entirely different rule. So there are two main calculator functions. Um, so the binomial probability density function, or PDF, um, is given, which gives you like a particular x value. So if, if I've got, you know, the probability of x is equal to two, that's when I want to use a PDF, right? If you're not sure where this is on your CAS, um, Google is probably your best bet. Um, I'm not sure what CAS everyone uses. I use the TI Inspire. So if you do use the TI Inspire, it's, you know, go into the menu and then um, under probability. And if you scroll down, you'll find binomial, I think. And then from binomial, you can find binomial PDF. And just pressing that in and filling out the, the information page that comes up will just give you the value. Um, binomial CDF, cumulative density function, as it says is cumulative, it sums up, right? It sums up multiple terms. So um, it'll, it'll generally do things that are like greater than or less than or greater than and equal to or less than and equal to. And you don't really have to worry about the, um, you don't have to worry about converting things like x's less than one to probability of x is equal to zero, it'll just do it for you, right? So just write it in as the question says, um, simply because you won't make a mistake doing this conversion. You, you're not gonna, like, if you do that conversion by hand, you might make a mistake, but it's super unlikely that you make that conversion mistake when you're doing it, just entering into the calculator, because the calculator just calculates it for you. Okay, let's talk a bit about the probabilities of the mean and the variance. So the expectation allow us to work with mean and variance of a random variable without rewriting the distribution, right? So what do I mean by that? So if I have, you know, some new distribution, right, but it's only multiplied, you know, it's like some scalar multiple plus some constant, I can just use the old mean and continue on. Right. So sometimes this is a really common question type. Um, they'll like give you um, some X term and then they'll say, let's double that X term. Right. And then add B to it or add some value to it. If you want to calculate that out, just sort of use this rule here. And um, with the variance, it's a little bit complicated. Um, the B just disappears. Right. And the A comes out the front and gets squared. And it's the same as A squared times the variance of X. Um, so the variance has no horizontal translation. I'll give you guys some time to think about this. Um, drop your answer in chat or, or your guess. Obviously, the, you know, there's, there's no um, penalty for getting the wrong answer. Um, this is a good idea to sort of brainstorm as to why variance could have no horizontal translation. Um, and I'll answer that question on the day. So um, yeah, just chuck it in chat. Um, if you are re-watching the recording um, from the day, I recommend taking some notes of that. Um, okay, let's get on to continuous probability. So what is continuous probability and what's the difference between discrete and continuous probability, right? So continuous, a continuous random variable is that one that can take up any real number, right? So it doesn't have to be an integer or a natural number, right? A continuous random variable has some of these properties. So it needs to be greater than zero for all of x. So keep in mind, I'm now using a function. It's a bit strange, right? But we'll sort of see why a function makes more sense than what we saw earlier. So the probability must be, what this simply says is that the probability must be greater than zero for all x possibilities, right? Which is just stock standard for probability. Um, the area enclosed by the graph and the x-axis must be equal to one, right? So that's taking an integral from um, oh, from a to b of f of x minus zero d of x must be equal to one. It's more accurate actually to write infinity in both of these, 
so negative infinity to infinity. So for the full length of that function, the area enclosed must be equal to one. Okay, um, and so you know that's sort of represented here. If I but if I want to work out um, between two particular areas, um, I need to work out the integral, right? Um, so the probability of x is less than less than a is also equal to the probability of x is greater than or equal to a. Oh, wait, less than or equal to a, sorry. Um, so here are a couple different variables um, that are um, going to be under a continuous probability, oh, sorry, that two of them are under a continuous probability like you guys just saw, and one of them isn't. And I'm gonna sort of explain why. Well, obviously with postcodes, you can't have, you know, like decimal, you generally don't have decimal points with postcodes, right? You'd hope. Um, whereas with metro, like, you know, time that things can run late by or height, like I mentioned earlier, that's going to be on a spectrum, right? It's going to be on some, you know, continuous scale. So hence those two are continuous, whereas postcodes is not. So we generally represent um, continuous probability by what's known as a probability density function or a PDF, right? So when we talk about continuous variables, we refer to them over an interval rather than a particular case. Right. So we ask, you know, what's the probability that someone is between 163 and 178? Right. Because that includes these point heights, like, you know, 0 0.9, 0 0.2. Right. So if we want to find 163 to 178, we want to take the integral from 163 to 178 right, of f of x with respect to dx, right, as shown in the slide earlier. Oh, sorry, I should go back. Um, so yeah, when we're, when we're doing those calculations, um, 163, 178, those are going to be our terminals, right? Um, another thing to note is that you can't find, for a continuous probability function, you can't find a particular case. Um, I'll give you guys maybe a, a second to think about that. Why could that be true? Type your answer in chat. Why can, you know, why would this be equal to zero? Because, because it is, okay? One possible sort of explanation is that if I want to work this out for a probability um, density function, right, when that when it's a continuous function, what I'm doing is I'm taking an integral from 163 to 163 in both cases of f of x dx, which is just capital F of 163 minus f of 163, right, which is just equal to zero. Now let's, you know, mathematically that's sound, right? But let's sort of think about it in a realistic sense, right? And um, I want you guys to type, you know, the, your thoughts on that into chat rather than just, you know, um, the, 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 the thoughts about, you know, why it's mathematically zero, right? So let's think about, you know, like a, like a group or like a sample of, you know, like a hundred people. Well, let's just think about the Australian population in general, right? What's the probability that Let's say you put all of every Australian like person on, on Australia, let's say you put them in a bag, right? Like you, let's say you just have an infinitely large bag, you can put them into a bag, and then you reach your hand in, you grab one of them, you pull them out. What's the probability that they're exactly equal to 163 centimeters? Like what's the probability that their height is exactly 163 centimeters, right? Super low, impossible, right? In that scale, maybe there's like one, maybe there's one person who's exactly 163 centimeters, but it's out of millions, right? Like, like too many, right? It's 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 just a it's you know that's just approximately zero, right? So in both, like you know, mathematically using the sort of calculations we've been taught, and you know using sort of sense and logic, we can sort of see why you know with continuous probability it's really hard to find a particular value that's not equal to zero. So your probability you know, continuous probability questions are always going to be like, you know, what's the probability this guy's, or, you know, the, this population's height is between these two values? What's the probability that, you know, this ball has a speed between these two values, or less than this, or greater than this, right? If they ask you a question like, what's the probability of x is less than 100 and, like, less than 100, um, you would do an integral from, you know, an upper bound of 100 to, from negative infinity to an upper bound of 100, right? Why is it okay to use negative infinity? Sorry, that's not a negative 8. 
infinity. Why is it okay to use a negative infinity? Because it's likely your probability density function tapers out at the bottom. Maybe it looks a bit like this, right? So from here, you know, which is like about 100, let's say that's 100. And, you know, this just keeps going on and on and it gets, keeps getting closer to zero, right? Once it's past x is equal to zero, um, you know, the, the y-axis, it's hit zero, right? Um, but yeah, so if you're doing from negative infinity to 100, you're really only capturing this region, right? Which is fine, which, which is like perfectly fine. Um, so when you're doing less than, I'd recommend using negative infinity. If you're doing probability of x is greater than 100, I'd recommend using, you know, your upper bound um, as infinity and, oh, my infinity symbols are not it today, and 100, right? So f of x dx, so 100 to infinity, because that's, you know, 100 is your lower bound, okay? Um, hopefully that makes some sense. So we're going to finish off today by talking about the normal distribution. So what is it? Um, what does it mean for something to be normally distributed? It means that the data is you know, it has a fixed mean and it follows a bell curve shape, right? So it's a special type of continuous probability, right? It's the most, you know, common type of continuous probability that you will see and you've probably seen in your day-to-day. -day. It's it's these sorts of shapes, right? Where, like, the, the center is, is the mean, okay? Um, and ooh, it's generally given a sort of, you know, like with binomial, you know, how we write it with bi. In this case, we write x is distributed with n for normal of mu comma sigma squared or variance, right? Like so. Um, the actual equation for a normal distribution is this, and you will never use this, right? You can maybe have a go chucking it into your calculator. Um, maybe like, you know, for, 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 for fun, maybe throw in like mu is equal to um, one, sigma is equal to one, or mu is equal to zero, sigma is equal to one, that's your standard normal distribution. Um, and maybe, you know, doing it from, like integrating it from, you know, um, zero to one, see what you get. Um, your calculator might chug for a while, um, but it should spit out a nice value. Um, but yeah, you'll, you'll never use that, so don't, don't worry about that too much. Um, like I said, it follows this really um, special bell-shaped curve. And what's really nice about this, um, so this one here is your, your standard sort of normal distribution. You can see that its mean is centered at zero, so mu is equal to zero, right? Um, and here, this is just the probability, right? You don't need to worry too much about the y-axis, or frequency, sorry, not probability. You don't need to worry too much about the y-axis in continuous functions. Really, what's important is the area under the curve, okay? So we can see here, here we have standard deviations, right? And each standard deviation captures a certain amount of percentage of the curve, right? So this is something you need to know, right? Um, so with normal distributions, one standard deviation is always going to capture 68% of the curve, right? So one SD is 68%, right? Two standard deviations is going to cover 95%, and three standard deviations is going to cover 99.7%. So it's totally by like, you know, it's totally reasonable for them to ask you um, to, to use these values to approximate things on a normal distribution. So you should know this. Um, know that standard deviation can either go up or down. So from zero to one, right, it captures 34%. And then from negative one to zero, it captures another 34%, which is where you get your 68 from. Same with the 95 and same with the 99.7. Um, so let's try to explain this bell curve, right? So the probability, like I said earlier with continuous probability functions, is found by the area under a graph over some interval, right? Um, so again, we use that, you know, same formula like we sort of talked about earlier, right? But since that function for a normal distribution is so complicated, it's just done using a calculator function. So you will have a normal PDF function um, that you can use to do this. Um, with the bell curve, most of your data lies around that mean, right? Like you can see within just one standard deviation, you already capture 68%, right? Within two, you already capture 95%. So a lot of your data is centered around the mean, right? So the further you go, you can see in these like small pockets here, you've only got 0.15%, right? 
Um, so tiny, tiny bits. Right? So the further you go, the less data you have. And so each line right, represents in, in this plot, right? Um, represents a standard deviation from the mean. So at the mean, you can see it says zero standard deviations from the mean. At one, it's plus one from the mean. At two, it's plus two from the mean, right? Um, so hopefully that makes sense. Um, sort of already copied this, so I'm gonna skip over that. So the, it's known as a 68, 98.95, 99.7% rule. And yeah, you do need to know this. So let's have a crack at this. So if the age of students in a particular awesomely spectacular methods lecture, maybe this one, um, was normally distributed with a mean of 17 and a standard deviation of 23, over what range do we expect 68% of the students to lie? Um, well, so we have a distribution, normal distribution, right? Which is what they've said, normally distributed here. Um, so mean, we said was 17. And standard de deviation is 0.3. So here, again, that represents the variance. So that's just sigma squared. So you can just write 0.3 squared. So using our rule, right, 68% of our data lies between one, it lies within the one standard deviation of mean, right? And so all you have to do is 17 minus 0.3 and 17 plus 0.3. So your data is going to be between 16.7 and your ages are going to be with 68% lies is between 16.7 and 17.3 years old. Okay. So I've mentioned the standard normal before, or the standard normal distribution. I said it has a mu of zero, so mean of zero, standard deviation of one, right? So we usually represent it with a Z instead of an X, right? Just so we don't get confused. So Z always generally represents the standard normal um, curve, right? So it's got a mu of one, uh, I mean mu of zero, it has a sigma squared or variance of one and a standard deviation. Um, of one, sorry, so scribble that standard deviation of one. Okay, so we can get any normal. The the really neat part about a normal distribution is that we can get any normal distribution and move it to a standard normal distribution. How do we do that? We do we use this equation, right? So any normal variable or standard normal variable is equal to a you know the normal variable minus the mean of that normal variable. So these means and standard deviations are different from zero and one, right? So it'll be whatever it is for the, the distribution. So the standardized value tells us the number of standardized standard deviations, the X value lies from the mean, right? So this can be particularly useful for using that 68, 99.7 rule, right? So um, Avika claims that the VC scores are calculated this way, though I'm not 100% sure on that. Um, I mean, it's it's likely that it is. They they what they do is they do try to put it on a normal distribution, so you have study scores um, represented that way with the with the mean at thirty. Um, but I'm not one hundred percent sure. I'm not an expert on how they do that. Um, let's go through an example using this formula. So let's say we have a you know the same sort of distribution as before, median. Uh, I mean, uh, mean of seventeen with a. Um, variance of 0.3 squared. So how many standard deviations of the mean from the mean is the age 17.6? Okay, so let's try to work that out. So we just chuck that into our equation. So 17.6 minus 17 divided by 0.3, um, that's just equal to so 17.6 minus 17 is equal to 0 0.6. 0 0.6 by 0.3 is just equal to 2. And if we try to work that out with 16.7 as well, we'll see that we get negative one, right? But that still, that just means we've gone, instead of going above the mean, we've just gone below the mean, right? So at the end of the day, that's still one standard deviation away from the mean, okay? And now they want us to approximate this. They want us to approximate 16.7, um, you know, the, the probability of the age is 16.7 to 17.6. <coughs> So how do we do that? So first, oh, I'm going to work out um, this. And that tells me the probability that it's one standard deviation below, right? So if I go back to, uh, ooh, sorry. Um, yeah, so if we go back to, I might go one more back to, to the bigger image. Um, sorry about that. So if we go back, 
um, to this one, right, we can see that one standard deviation is um, 68. And so I've gone here, right? So I've gone here. And now I want to go to here, right? So that's what we're doing. That's the calculation more or less, right? So I've gone, the probability captured here is 0.68 divided by two. And what's captured in here is going to be 0.34 plus 13.135, right? Which is more or less what we've done um, when we go to our question. Um, sorry about going so far back. I just thought it'd be good to show the image. Um, so that's where that comes from, and this is also where this comes from. It's just like you know, calculating the upper half of that. And so when we sum them together, we get the probability is equal to 0.815. Um, just to continue with the example, this is, yeah, this is just what I just showed. Um, so all we're doing is we're working out this, right, which is just equal to 0.68 by 2. And then we're also working what this is, which is just equal to 0.95 by 2. Um, so this rule is approximate, right? So, you know, it's not exactly 68%, but it's it's good enough, right, for that um, determination. But, you know, for exam one, that's good enough because they only want approximates. But, you know, to, to work, actually work out your exact values, you're going to have to use your calculator. And like I said earlier, you, you want to be using the normal CDF and not the PDF, um, just this, this CDF function. Um, so... Let's have a crack at this question here. So find the exact percentage of the amount of data that lies within one standard deviation of the mean. So we just enter our values on the CAS. You can actually TI inspire anyways. You can just type in norm CDF, or you can also find it under menu probability. And so you just enter the various variables like this, right? Um, so this is your lower and upper bound. So this is your lower bound, and this is your upper bound. And here, this is your mean, and this is your standard deviation. So when you do that, this is the, the exact value. Um, it's about 68%, but you know, this is good enough. Um, all right, let's have a crack at this one here as well. Um, so the height of a giraffe is normally distributed with a mean of 4.3 meters and a variance of 0.05. Find the probability that the height is greater than 4.5. Um, Again, I'd like to write out my variables. And the lower bound, right, is, so it's just greater than 4.5. The upper bound is infinity. So you can just enter that in to your calculator, and you get 0. Uh, 0.186. Um, now, this one here is conditional, right? So the probability of the height of a giraffe is greater than 4.5, given that it's 4.2, right? So that um, numerator is the probability of x is greater than 4.5, intersecting with the probability that x is greater than 4.2, right? And the intersection between these two regions, right, is probability of x is greater than 4.5, which is why that's only present in the numerator. So entering that into our calculator, we'll get this. Okay, so Toby is delivering seven giraffes to the Melbourne Zoo. What is the probability that less than four giraffes, oh, that, that less than four of his giraffes are less than 4.35 meters tall? So again, we just create our variable. So the probability that x is less than 4.35 um, is what we will work out. So lower bound negative infinity, upper bound 4.35. So we answer our all in, we get 0.588. Now that's not the entire question, right? We want less than four drafts, right, out of seven. So now we can do a success failure sort of definition. So now we're applying a binomial distribution to a normal distribution. Um, and so, you know, we can use this as our fixed probability, sub it in, use a binomial distribution. Again, I'm now I'm going to be using um, binomial CDF. And there we go. All right, um, let's talk a bit about the inverse normal. So the inverse normal is, you know, the inverse of a normal CDF, right? So whereas the normal CDF gives us, you know, the probability, um, the inverse normal gives us the upper bound, assuming that we're taking a negative, you know, the lower bound is negative. So it always finds the areas left to a value, okay? So the total time people spend scrolling Netflix is normally distributed with a mean of 120 hours and standard deviation of 10 hours. Um, and so again, I always like to write out my variable like this. Um, it is found out that 10% of people have wasted their life. So this is point one. 
a person has wasted their life if they spend more than eight hours scrolling Netflix. Find A. So we can use probability of X is greater than A um, is equal to 0.1. So we need to change it so that it's on the left, right? So X is less than A. We're using that complement rule. I'm just doing 1 minus 0.1, which gives me 0.9. And then I can chuck that into my calculator. So the inverse norm is a function under probability as well. And that gives you 132.86. Um, and in some cases, we're not given you know, standard deviation or the mean. However, we can determine these using a normal inverse function, right? Or inverse norm. So we've got um, from earlier, z is equal to x minus mu over sigma. And so what we can do is we can standardize functions. So that means, you know, even though it's like some different normal distribution, we can bring it back to the standard normal distribution using this equation here, right? Which, you know, is z n zero one. So here's an example. So x is normally distributed with a mean mu and a standard deviation sigma. It is known that 35% of the data lies under x is equal to 6, and 45% lies above x is equal to 10. And now they want us to find mu and sigma. So I'll let you guys have a crack um, and you know while we work it out. So the probability that x is less than 6 is equal to 0.35, which is given in the question. Probability of x is greater than 10. Um, is equal to 0.45, which is also given in the question. So I can use my um, z is equal to x minus mu over sigma from earlier to sort of standardize it to the standard normal distribution, right? Then I can use inverse normal because the the, the area known um, under the standard normal distribution is like a known quantity. So inverse normal can handle it reasonably well. Um, and so I work out what the area is, sub that into my um, so I work out what z is, more or less, right? And then from there, I can use simultaneous equations to solve for mu and sigma. Um, here's a couple of exam questions that I won't go through just for the sake of time, but you guys are more than, you know, the, the solutions are there, and it's always a good idea to have to go through those. Um, so that brings us to the end of today. So in summary, we sort of just covered, um, you know, a, a brief understanding of integration, and we went into a lot about probability. Now, I would want to. I would like to remind everyone that that's not, you know, everything. What is, you know, method? What, at the end of the day, methods is primarily about um, the the problem solving. So, although the content is all covered here, um, it is really important to go ahead and practice these con concepts um, and try to get your hands on any sorts of questions you guys can. Um, but yeah, hopefully you guys enjoyed today. Um, if you have any questions, chuck them in chat. More than happy to answer them. Um, and you know, if I maybe miss your question or you you're watching a recording um or like recording after this session has like you know aired um feel free to shoot me an email from the email at the start so it's just aj at tutesmart.com and i'll get back to you as soon as possible so hopefully you guys enjoyed today and i'll um good luck with your um rest of methods three and four but yeah hey